<laughs> I guess the best part of the, uh, the video are those costumes. Uh, I skipped through all these lyrics, but if uh, Amanda has been able to join us. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about emotions and money. We started the season of Inspire by talking about fear and then anger and then shame. Uh, and so today, we're talking about emotions and money, and I think it's interesting that uh, financial expert Susie Orman says that fear and anger and shame are the emotions most often connected to money. Our core beliefs about money mostly took root during our childhood. How did our parents view money? How did they approach spending, saving, and giving? Good morning. Think about how money impacts your own emotional state. Are you happier when you walk in the door carrying a new purchase in your arms or when you see uh, your bank account balance increase? What did you pick up about these messages in your youth? What if you got a surprise windfall, maybe a million dollars? Would you make a list of what you were going to buy or would you try to figure out your investment strategy? Would you feel joy, relief, guilt, or gratitude? Imagine being down to your last penny. Would you feel fear, <laughs> panic, depression, anger? Just the thought of having nothing, losing everything, can throw us into an emotional tailspin. When people feel stress about money, and I'm totally ignoring my slides here, when people feel stress about money, they often blame themselves. They feel embarrassed, ashamed, isolated, and stupid for the situation they're in. Financial problems are still pretty stigmatized in our society. But that kind of negative self-talk can be damaging to far more than our bank account. It can lead to shame, hopelessness, depression, and even suicide. My own relationship with money has changed over time. I was lucky enough to grow up having enough. Then as an adult with a successful career, I found I had more than enough. And then I had nothing. Having enough was better. <laughs> it was a lot better. When I had nothing, I was much more fearful, and I was more selfish about what little I had. Having more allows me to be more generous. Talk about money, socioeconomic status, and the widening wealth inequality tends to move us from objective observation to emotional conviction faster than you can swipe your credit card. Human beings are emotional about money, and money affects our emotions. Money can make us feel powerful or powerless, arrogant or worthless. Are you more embarrassed to let people know what you can't afford or what you can afford? Again, I vacillate. I love to talk about all the trips that Leaf and I take. But I always want to make sure that people know we can only do it because Leaf's job provides such generous flight benefits. I take a certain kind of pride in knowing that most of my clothes are from Goodwill or a good friend or a good long time ago. <laughs> I didn't always have this complex relationship with money. Money used to be my goal. When I would set out my 10-year plan, each year was about having a higher income. I married someone with similar goals, and we built our dream house together. And then I became the director of Muskegon County Habitat for Humanity. And I started reading Clarence Jordan and Millard Fuller, and men who wondered out loud how much any one person needs to have. And I started becoming embarrassed about that house because it felt like more than I needed to have. Eventually, for a lot of other reasons, I walked away from that marriage, that house, and all the wealth that it contained. I took a voluntary vow of poverty. I found subsistence work, and I set out to do the work I felt I was called to do. But when my hours were cut during the crisis of 2008, I literally did not have enough to get by. And every paycheck started to diminish my own sense of self-worth. Recognizing that that wasn't any way to live, I relinquished my vow of poverty. Do you know that when you relinquish a vow of poverty, the money doesn't just automatically come back? <laughs> it took a while, but I finally got solidly back on my feet, and I continued to work to try to balance having enough to feel secure and to be generous 
while also working to make a difference rather than working to make money. So many of the messages that we receive from society tell us we need more, especially at Christmas time, when we live in a period of commercialism and materialism run amok. At its worst, money can become the measure we use to value our other human beings, and even ourselves. And that is a dangerous and slippery slope. Neither our worthiness or that of our neighbor <laughs> has anything to do with how much money we have in the bank or how much debt we have. It doesn't depend on what gadgets we own or how often we eat out. Oscar Wilde said it this way, ordinary riches can be stolen, real riches cannot. In your soul are infinitely precious things that cannot be taken from you. We can save or we can spend, but in the end we need to realize that our value comes from within that you and I and all whom we encounter are valuable, are worthy, and are the real riches of our land. What I'd like to do for a reflective exercise is think about that whole idea of a million dollars. What would you do with a million dollars? There are pads of paper on the table that have lines. I think it's a to-do list, but there's lines. So you can write on that or you can make a list I don't see a pad up here, so let's get one for you guys. Please, one of the pages. Well, well, well. And, uh, and we'll just let uh, bare naked ladies entertain us while we do that. <laughs>